Okay, so today, what are we going to do? Instead of looking for the animals in their field, we're going to be looking at some of the scientists, or in particular one scientist, that works on some pretty cool animals and is doing some pretty cool research. We also get to see what a lab looks like. Hey! Hey, Dr. Biology, how are you? This I'm doing great, and who we have here is Professor Michael Angeletta. He's a biologist, works on some really cool animals and some really cool research. And we came by, if it was okay with you, as I'm looking around at your lab, uh, and I see so many things that, well, look like you could get them from Target. Sure. Or even Sears. What, I mean, over here, it looks like, what, you, you cornered the market on uh, refrigerators. Yeah, well, this is a very, very expensive, overpriced refrigerator, but it does almost the same thing. If you open it up, you can see, you know, you could keep food on the shelves, and it would certainly keep the temperatures low, but you can also heat these things up, too. And there's a computer that controls the temperature. So we could program it to heat and cool however we want. Ah, so what kind of temperature are you talking about? Depends on what we're studying. So sometimes we keep a constant temperature. Sometimes we fluctuate the temperature throughout the day. Wow. So for example, we've been studying eggs and they live in the soil where it heats up in the day and cools down at night. So we let the temperature fluctuate that way. Oh, all right. So it's got a timer system in there and it yep. recreates that temperature change. It's all computerized. So it costs a lot more than a refrigerator from Sears, but it's similar. All right. Well, show me around. You know, this is like a pretty cool looking lab. Can you show me some of the things that are going on? Sure. So this summer, we've been really interested in, in how organisms survive changes in temperature. We want to know about how they might respond to climate change. And we study lizards. So we've been studying how the eggs of lizards survive and hatch at different temperatures. And that's what we use these incubators for. If, if we want to know whether the egg is stressed, we might measure its heart rate. And this is a machine, you go to the hospital, you have your heart rate measured. You could have your heart rate measured if you were an egg in this machine. Just put the egg right there, close the box, and then we'll get a heart rate on the dial. Ah, all right. So the big question is, where's the egg and how come we're not seeing this happen now? Yeah, the, all the eggs have hatched because it's towards the end of the year now. And so what we have are the babies. Oh. The next best thing, right? Maybe yeah. even better. Okay, let's go check them out. So all these little terraria are filled with baby lizards that hatch from our experiment. Here's a little guy right here. And you can see they come out really small. I mean, for scale, there's my finger. Wow. I and mean, they're tiny, right? Yeah. And they're actually just a little bit smaller than that when they hatch. This one's been growing for a few weeks. Wow, up close and personal. What kind of lizard is this? This is, depending on the area of the country you live in, you'd call it a fence lizard or a prairie lizard. It, and it's found all throughout the United States, but the different populations have different common names. So how many baby lizards are there here? We've made hundreds of baby lizards this summer. Uh, what you see here are just the ones that we're doing an experiment with today. Ah, okay. So are you both mom and dad, or is there a role for mom and dad after they hatch? Well, it's funny. There's no role for mom or dad after the eggs are laid. So dad never has anything to do with caring for lizards. Mom, all she does is dig a hole, lay the eggs, fill the hole up. And after that, the eggs are on their own. And that's what we're interested in. Like, when they're in that nest, how do they survive? They have no help from mom. Right. So if it gets too hot, they could die. If it gets too cold, they might not hatch in time. Right, so the word that we've been using on some of the stories we're talking about to you is thermoregulation. That's right, right. Ah, uh, okay, so regulating temperature. Thermo meaning heat, right? That's right, regulating yeah. temperature. Yeah. And so you thermoregulate, you know, we thermoregulate our bodies to be quite warm. Now, if you're a lizard baby in an egg, mom's not gonna thermoregulate for you. And you can't move, you can't run around, right. so you have limited ability to, you know, get in the sun or get in the shade. Pretty much, you're on your own. And whatever the soil heats up to, that's how you're going to heat up. It is interesting, though. Somebody has shown that little baby embryos can move around inside an egg from the left side to the right side, depending on where the sun is. But you can see that's not very far, so right. you're very limited in what you can do. Yeah, so they can actually do a little bit of adjustment. Just a tiny bit, but not enough to make a big difference. Not enough. Okay. So let's look at a few other things you got going on here. I see. Actually, we have we have other researchers in here. Right? Yeah, this is Greg. He's an undergraduate from one of my classes, and he's uh, been helping out in the lab now for almost uh, eight months. Yeah. Huh? Getting, getting to that point where I'm feeling like I know what I'm doing. But yeah, it's, it's real exciting. Um, 
as, as a student, I always thought that science is what you're learning in the classroom, but you really got to broaden your horizon, really get out here and, and learn what science really is. Right. So that's, that's a really good point that here, not only do you have classes, but now you get real world experience in a lab. Exactly. Okay. So what was the one thing that you might have noticed that just didn't translate in the classroom that you really learned when you got into a lab? Really the importance of all the details. You always read in, in the textbooks about, okay, the scientists were studying about thermoregulation. In your head you go, okay, they changed the temperature. But to really be in the lab seeing how much they really have to tweak it, how much control is really involved in all the experiments is really startling to me. Because it's really delicate instruments being used and, and data taken. So has it helped you in your classes? Oh, definitely. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. I, would, I recommend it. It's, it's great to, to have the background to then really come into uh, a class and understand what, what all came together to culminate the data that you're now looking at. Yeah, great. Details that Greg's referring to, let's say you want to heat up or cool down an egg. You would think it would be pretty easy, right? right? But it's not, because eggs can sweat in a, in a sense. They lose water, and when they do that, they cool off. So if we wanted to control how the temperature of an egg was changing, we had to go to some great lengths to do that. Well, one of the things we did were put eggs in these little containers, like, as you said, from Target, an ordinary ball jar. Ah. You might put jelly in. Right. And we seal this up and have a small probe that records the temperature. Then we put that egg into a bath. It's filled with water. Uh -huh. And the water bath then heats or cools the egg to exactly what temperature we want. Then we take the egg in the container out and we bring it into a room where we can make the measurements of heart rate and the whole room's temperature is controlled to be what we want. All that is details that Greg's talking about to make sure that every time we make that measurement the egg's exactly at the right temperature. So you're trying to get as close to what nature does as possible. That's right. And we want to heat and cool the egg at just the right rate when we make these measurements. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's go you want to go see that room? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. I got to say that, you know, this looks like the typical lab, you know. It doesn't look like the type that they... It's, it's not mess. like CSI where everything's all tidy, no, right? No, it's always a mess because we're always doing something and we never have time to get to, to clean up. We're constantly collecting data. Uh, it's a little noisy in here because of the air circulation. But here's a couple of undergraduate researchers. Hello. This is um, Colton and Don. And these guys are actually taking the baby lizards that we hatched and seeing how physically fit they are. So if we want to know if they're in good shape, we put them through some exercises. In this case, they're running them at a track. And we're going to look at whether they're fast or slow. Let me go get a new one. We'll see that. Okay. This is one of those 57D hatched yeah, I can tell it's actually a lot warmer in here too. It's very warm. Yeah. Because they're running them at the temperature that their bodies prefer to be at. So, you know, we're at uh, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? When we don't have a fever. These lizards are pretty close to that. So when you walk in there, it feels warm. Right. Well, you know, there's another thing we need to talk about. We use the word thermal regulation. A lot of people also talk about warm-blooded and cold-blooded. And that's really not an accurate way to describe it, is it? Yeah, we don't use those terms anymore as scientists. Um, and the reason is, lizards can actually be really warm. What's different is how they stay warm. So we stay warm by burning food that we eat. We take that, the, the energy that's in food, we use it to generate heat. Lizards will stay warm a much cheaper way. They basically seek out areas where there's sunlight and they heat themselves up using the energy in the sun. So we do the same thing, right? Because, you know, we're in Phoenix here and you realize that on a hot day, we go to the shade because that's the place you want to be to cool off. Right. And on a cold day in the winter, we might go out into the sun. So those kinds of movements help us, but it's not our primary way of thermoregulating. For a lizard, it's the only way they can thermoregulate. So you've been raising hundreds of lizards. Have you ever had an escapee? Yeah. Actually, embarrassingly, we found a baby lizard that had hatched in the incubator and we didn't know where it came from, so we called it Jim. You <laughs> called it Jim. We, we gave it a name and we made it the lab mascot because we weren't sure which experimental treatment it was part of. Oh, right, right. Well, let's go look a little bit more here. I see, I see lots of sinks, which you'd expect. Yeah. I also noticed when we were walking in here, it looks like something you'd see out of a, another, maybe a CSI. You have a special little chamber here. Oh, right. Okay. So you need this for working with lizards? So, you know, we're not building viruses or anything like at CSI, but, but what we do sometimes is we try to do 
studies of the tissues that are in animals' bodies. You might want to know, for example, when a lizard lays an egg, does the egg have a lot of energy or a little bit of energy? So when we do that, we have to dry the egg, and then we have to combust it. We basically blow it up, essentially, and see how many calories, how much heat it produces. It's the same way they figure out how many calories in your food. They use the same machines that we use here. But when we dry the eggs, we can't have them picking up water from the atmosphere. So we put the eggs inside this chamber, and when we're dealing with these samples, if we're grinding them up or if we're weighing them, we we'll always have them inside the chamber where the air is completely dry. And you would have to do that using these gloves. They always have static cling on them. They're fun to put on. <laughs> you put on these gloves, and then you'd be able to open up the door to take something in or out, to take it in, and then you'd mess with your sample. You might weigh it. You might prepare it. And then when you want to put it out, you open up the door again, you put it in this little hatch, you seal the inside, and then you can open up the outside and get it. It's kind of neat. Almost everybody that comes into here points out this because they think, you know, we must be building viruses or something <laughs> crazy inside this chamber. But it's really quite simple. And then this machine is where we actually blow it up, where we actually put the, um, the sample into a little chamber. They call, they call that chamber a bomb. And so you would put the sample on this on a little dish in here, and then you would seal it up really tight in this chamber. And then you'd fill up this chamber with oxygen. What do we learn in fire safety class, right? What do you need to make a fire? You need a fuel source, you need heat, and you need oxygen. So you got a fuel source, you got oxygen, then we make a spark. And that's what this machine does. And it lets off heat, heat heats up the water in the machine, and what's a calorie? It's the amount of heat required to raise a gram of water by one degree Celsius. So that's how we figure out how many calories are in it. Ah, very. Really neat. simple. I mean, it looks fancy, but it's really simple science. Right, but it's, it's an interesting thing because you've got field studies, right? You're going out into the field to collect animals, right? And then you also get to do the lab. Right, yeah, I get the best of both worlds. I get right. to take trips all over the country. Right. I get to go out to really interesting field sites. Sometimes there's mountains, sometimes there's forests and canyons. And then I get to come back here and I do fun experiments with fun people. And at the end of that, then I go teach. And then you get to go teach. Yeah, right? it's a great yeah. job. Well, as we look around the lab, I have to say it's very cool. I really appreciate you letting me stop by and say hello. And. Uh, We'll stop in uh, and maybe see uh, some other things like uh, the, the lizard races, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll put those on as well so that people can watch those. Sounds great. Thanks again. Thanks, Dr. Biology. Thanks for coming.